What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, May 20th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat. Stand up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, who is paying for free wind energy? Or as the Penguin Empire reports, who's paying for lunch? A great Substack articles from our friends over at the Penguin Empire reports Substack channel. We recommend everybody following them. Next up, widespread power outages from deadly Houston storm raises new risk. Quote, hot weather. That's a, from NPR. Devastating storm that happened there um, on uh, Wednesday, Thursday. So we'll cover that in detail next up. Biden administration increasing tariffs on 18 billion of imports from China. Staying along that Chinese thread, electric vehicle buying interest declines for the first time since 2021. And finally, Chinese companies should not benefit from the EV critical minerals tax credit. Stool, then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets. We did see both oil and natural gas pop on Friday, which is uh, great to see uh, natural gas above $2.60. So an absolute Wow. Rebound as we're heading into the summer months. And then finally, Crescent Energy from the top shelf. They swoop in to buy Silver Bow as the U.S. shale merger continues. And, oh, it's going to be very interesting considering the, the, the saga we've, we've covered around Silver Bow and Kimridge. And now enter a third player, Crescent Energy. We will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. It's been a few days for me, Stu. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start off with uh, the buddies over here at Penguin Empire. Who's paying for free energy wind? Or as Penguin Empire reports, who's paying for lunch? Michael, there are no free lunches. And I, I absolutely love what they did. Let me tee this up a little bit. Uh, when you sit back and, and, and try to think, Michael, there's a, a fallacy out there that wind is free. Wind energy is free. It's not free. And who's paying for it? And so I did not understand some of the things in here. Uh, Ms. Producer, if you could bring up the four technology trends chart. It's coming up. It says turbine capacity, rotor uh, diameter, and hub height have all increased significantly over the long term. Michael, I didn't understand this, uh, really taking a look at it. In the United States, 2022, the average uh, newly installed was 3.2 megawatt. That's 7% and three uh, than larger than in 2021, but it's up 350% since 1999. That is just, those are huge. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, with if you haven't seen a wind farm in person, I'd highly recommend going and finding one because the physical footprint of these things are unbelievable. If you haven't driven down a road before and seen you've got the the, the truck in front of them, that's the, you know, watch out wide load. That's a mile above because then you've got these trucks that just are carrying one blade that are taking up two lanes on a highway. You've got the other service vehicle behind. So the they're really a huge footprint relative to um relative to say an oil and gas well i mean heck if you have an opportunity our friends over at pecos energy and rt i've been out to their well site multiple times the footprint of their well and then in the background you can see a wind farm it's unbelievable you'll be shocked You're like wait wait i'm on an oil i'm in an oil field right but yet the physical footprint of this field is drastically lower than the three windmills or wind farms that are behind them. Outstanding point. And you, you teed it up perfectly, Michael, even without, a, you know, for our uh, podcast listeners at home, I'm going to pay him after this podcast because Miss producer, if you could bring up the uh, slide that says it is the one, the second one down that has the, this gas plant doesn't need all those multiple steps. I'll tag it in there for you. There are, there, you can see in the lower right-hand corner, it says 103 uh, megawatt gas power plant. Look at how small that is. Then you go up to the next three sections across. Each of those are sections, Michael. Look how much land that is taking up compared to one natural gas plant. Isn't that crazy? Well, yeah, absolutely. And that that uh, 103 megawatt gas plant 
is the amount of power that that is going to, or the amount of things that that powers relative to even that wind farm up there is unbelievable. And the gas power is dispatchable. Exactly. Uh, and, and so that one single graphic for anybody that is understanding what a section of land is, that is just unbelievable. It's a uh, mile by mile. Mile by mile on that, baby. Uh, and then uh, in this also, there's table six. We don't need to bring that up because it's pretty detailed, but it has a really amount of tonnage that is required for each windmill. And we're, here's where I want to give a shout out for what I'm trying to understand in, in making money, and that is land reclamation after wind farm death. Wind farms uh, do not last 30 years. They, they're lucky if they last five to eight before they have to be reworked in order to get to maintenance uh, without having all that. That's a whole nother story. Here's where I want to get into. Who's paying for the land reclamation of these horrible uh, land uh, problems at the end of these things? We'll be talking about that more and with videos later on. Let's go to the next one here, Michael. Okay. Widespread power outages from deadly Houston storm raises new risk. Hot weather. This is from NBR. <laughs> A, our prayers go out for anybody that's affected. Michael, there was over 1.2 million people affected on Friday between New Orleans and in Texas. And our prayers go out to everybody. If you go to energynewsbeat.com and you take a look at under the uh, top menu bar, there's resources, go to, uh, power outages. And right now at the time we're filming this on Sunday afternoon, there are 331,000 people still without power, uh, from this storm. And Michael, they said there was 400 mile an hour wind, uh, that took out major transmission lines. This is going to be a little while before this comes back in. So um, as the Houston uh, area uh, meteorologist says, it was 90 degrees are expected through the start of the coming week with heat indexes approaching 100. Uh, we expect the impact to gradually increase. Uh, don't overdo yourself. Uh, but when you take a look, uh, Miss Producer, if you could bring up that picture of the grid down power lines, this is amazing. Michael, these things are supposed to stand up to 200 mile an hour plus winds. They're they're wrapped up like toothpicks. I yeah. mean, this is unbelievable, the damage that was done. It, it, I mean, obviously, these storms were deadly. It does point out that, you know, our infrastructure from an electrical standpoint is is fairly flat, fragile. And we, we, we talk a lot about the show about the cyber you, you know, the, the whole cyber side of the, the the electrical grid and how a cyber attack could take it all down. We don't talk much about how fragile the physical infrastructure is. And in terms of updating the grid, not only updating the grid to handle the new wave of renewables that are coming, but just and, allow and us to be more sustainable relative to the weather is definitely needed. Oh, absolutely. And, and this brings up one comment that I would like to address all uh people and 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 that is take a look at a jackery it's a small generator they're 350 dollars on uh amazon 200 uh uh solar to help do that okay great you got that little jackery that'll supply you with light and being able to su uh, supply a little bit of stuff just for safety reasons Make sure that you have a communication plan. Have a 72-hour bag for natural disasters and or man-made disasters uh, that could be coming. Be prepared. I think we need to come out with Energy News Be Preparedness bags. I'm all in, baby. I think we need to. And, and, and Michael, you, we laugh about it, and you tease me for trying to preach being prepared. But you know what? If I save a life, I'm gonna go to you one day, okay? I hope oh, absolutely! I I'm I'm all <laughs> I'm all about it. If there's anybody that's ready for preparedness, it's you. All right, what's next? Let's go to Biden administration increasing tariffs on 18 billion dollars of imports from China. Michael, um, I I gotta keep that joke. I had a joke on Biden, and I was just gonna 
keep my mouth before uh, HR got a hold of me on that one. Okay, let's go to this one. In the release sent to Rig Zone, uh, Isenta, which describes itself as leading the ocean freight rate benchmarking, new tariffs under President Biden may uh, be a case of history repeating, said Peter Sand, chief of uh, analyst at Zenta. If so, businesses will be braced for increasing supply chain costs. And ultimately, it will be the U.S. consumers that pay for it. The Biden administration, I'm going to say the Biden administration because he does not know who he is. The Biden administration running this country does not understand anything about geopolitical management of supply chains and delivering low cost energy. They are going to ruin the grid through this. These let's go through some of the tariff rates. The tariff rate on lithium ion EV batteries will increase from 7.5 to 25 percent. But yet they're forcing everybody, Michael, to EVs. How in the world are they thinking that they can't afford to do it now, let alone with these tariffs on there? They're dumb. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is, you know, in we, we don't give Biden much credit. He is following the playbook that Trump started. He was, Trump was the first one to come out to put tariffs on China, specifically when it came to the EV space, but also this, the other inputs specifically to the critical minerals. So if we're going to, you know, so I, I'm a fan of this. If I, I'm usually a free market guy. But in this case, we have to look out for our own good. You don't think you think India would be doing this? Absolutely not. No, here's here's why I'm grumped out about this. I, I'm a seriously old grumpy man on this. Uh, and the reason is just because, not quite as old as Biden, but close. Well, hey, even never mind. OK, I, I guarantee you that he does not understand that he's forcing us to go to renewable energy these tariffs are going to affect renewable products. It's also in the critical minerals. It's also in everything else. And all of the products, though, all of these tariffs are going to be turned around and all of the prices for windmills, for solar panels, and everything else is going to go up. So as he sits back and tries to go to an energy transition, he is muddying the waters of the supply chain. That's not what Trump did. And so we can go into that again all other time. You're talking two different uh, 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 shell games here, dude. Hey, and I I'm call a, it like I see it. I'm an umpire. I just call it like I see it. I'm just calling well, balls you, and strikes You need here. some glasses then, Mr. Umpire, because <laughs> you, you did not call that one correctly. Let's go to the next one. Michael, this one is absolutely a hoot. Electric buying interest declines for the first time since 2021. This is in a report. There's markedly lower interest in EVs among people buying their first car from people to people who already had a car. Michael, I uh, this is unbelievable. Uh, let's take a look at quote in here. Uh, early drovers who drove more were found to be more likely considered buying an EV. But in the recent report, the trend is reversed and men falling fuel prices and anxiety about anxiety about charging uh, among consumers who commute 40 to 60 minutes a day each way. 24 percent were say they were very likely to consider an EV. Myron, that's most of the U.S. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think people are waking up a little bit. One, I think the high cost of EVs have, have pulled people back. It's one of the things we'll talk about. And then in the next uh, article that you'll cover, which kind of weaves the thread you've got here, but I think a lot has to do with the prices of EVs. I mean, I would, I have nothing wrong and I would love to consider a Tesla, but not for a hundred grand. I'd love to get in on something that has a little bit more, but not again for a hundred grand. People want to be able to move efficiently. They want to be able to travel for cheap. And as we've continued to see gas prices slightly right. come down, it's made that arbitrage relative to where we're about to see electricity prices this summer, you know, as we're going to cover with natural gas demand is going to go up a little bit. That arbitrage is going to close and almost flip. Okay, I'm going to go with my Ford 350 so I can tow all the stuff that I got to tow, my welders and everything else. I got to do all, I got work to do. And I'm going to get a hybrid. 
that's my next car is going to be a hybrid. I'm all in on that. Give me a 70 mile and a, a 70 mile per gallon with a hybrid. I love the idea. I'm going to be the guy that balances it out. But an EV right now, 100% EV family, I can't do it. Yeah. No, I mean, you're right. You know, it does. What's interesting is that that number of people who are who are interested in buying an EV are going down, while 68% of this, this article points out, 68% of consumers are now looking to add an extra vehicle to their household. Right. Um, now, what I, and I am going to on record, I would love to do a podcast with Elon. And if I could afford a, uh, I've got a plug ready to go for my cyber truck in my garage. It's already there. I already got a 220 ready, dedicated for my cyber truck. I just can't afford one. So Elon, if you want to sponsor the show, I'll buy us. Uh, I will take your money and sponsor it with that truck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, a the only reason I think I want a cyber truck is because it's bulletproof. It's the only reason. All right, let's go to the next one, Michael. <laughs> this one, if you're going to have tariffs, Chinese companies should not benefit from the EV critical mineral tax credit. Michael, you can't buy this kind of stupid. No wonder. You know, you've got great companies like uh, I interviewed the CEO and the president, two different, uh, two different people at the, different times from Frere Battery out of Norway. They're taking advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act, and I applaud that. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. They have renewable battery technology that makes sense. This does not. Let's go into this here. According to Joe Manchin, the key author of the tax credit, a core reason for disqualifying that batteries with uh, any mi minerals from foreign entities of concern from that tax credit was good bad actors, namely China, benefiting from the tax credit. Uh, moreover, the current perdition of the for uh, uh, definition of the foreign entity of concern only deems an entity a foreign entity of concern if engaged from the extraction, processing, or recycling of such material in a covered nation. Here's where it also does not cover that, Michael. And that is what about the batteries coming in from the new plants that they're putting in uh, in Mexico to undermine the EVs uh, for the U.S. manufacturers? This is a mess. Yeah, it really is a mess. And I think it goes, but it, 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 it goes to show that you know, you have to be very careful when you offer direct tax incentives. There's going to be a market for people to come in and attempt to undermine them. So I'm glad they're taking the step and at least making sure that Chinese companies can't and especially these bad actors can't take advantage because what are they trying to do? They're trying to come into the electrical vehicle market and lower the price because they can come in and right. offer much, much lower vehicle costs because they've done a good job over the last 15 to 20 years of shoring up the supply chain, which... You know, if, if you want to go back to why EVs are so expensive in the first place, it's because the supply chain is highly fractionalized. These critical minerals are extremely expensive to both get out of the ground. We've, we've talked at nauseum about, you know, the the human rights abuses that are happening from countries like Congo and other places in which they are uh, grabbed from. But that still means that and, and still, even though you're making a dollar a day with an axe and your baby on your back to mine these, they're still coming out to be, you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, just for one battery to come out and and fund these things so it's unbelievable i i'll applaud what jenner uh what senator joe manchin is doing here um at least trying to carve out this function oh i i agree and, and i applaud anybody standing up for america i don't care yes. if you're a democrat i don't care if you're a republican look out for america first no absolutely uh man, whatever happened to uh um, Fetterman's happening at a mansion right now. Oh, oh, I loved Fetterman. I, I, I did you see his quote? He's he, had so many of them. I, I swear, I think if a conspiracy theory was about was ever there, it's him. I think it's not the original Fetterman. I think they put a body double in because he's smarter, he's <laughs> better looking. I don't know what happened, but when he said, I, I, uh, I apologize. Or I, I originally said Congress was like uh, uh, going to a Jerry Springer show. 
I now have to apologize to Jerry Springer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Hats off to Fetterman. I, I you know, I, I, I now I'd even love to visit with him on the podcast. If you're listening, you know, Senator F uh, Fetterman, we're going to be uh, talking to uh, Senator Cruz here pretty quick. So might as well follow up with a Fetterman. Yeah, you're uh, you're you're busting into uh, Congress. How fun is that? <laughs> Um, I will go ahead and quickly cover um, the markets. But before we do that, guys, as always, we got to pay the bills around here. Thanks for checking out um, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis you just heard is brought to you by that website. Go ahead um, and hit the description below for all the links to the articles that we just talked about and timestamps. If you're listening to us on Spotify, if you're listening to us on iTunes, you just have to um, – uh, bear with us here. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. A lot of great stuff coming out this week. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting ready to release a deal spotlight covering um, Chevron buying Hess and the ensuing ExxonMobil debacle that is the Guyana and and, and Stabroic block. So uh, check out that great interview um, by Bennett Williams. Um, we'll, we'll try to probably drop that on Tuesday if you're listening to this, so uh, check that out tomorrow. Um, as always, guys, just check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com. You know, overall markets on Friday, Stu, it was, a, it was a pretty, you know, slow day just, just for the markets. We saw the S&P up um, a tenth of a percentage point. NASDAQ dropped about um, a tenth of a percentage point. Two-year and 10-year yields actually jumped. Two-year yields up about six tenths of a percentage point. Ten-year yields just above one percentage points dollar index fairly flat um staying there at 104 we did see bitcoin um stay fairly uh steady at 66,000 that's still up though week over week so bitcoin going on a little bit of a run crude oil finishes slightly positive about one percent for the week but about a half a percent for the day 79 58 and here's as the uh open is 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 rapidly approaching here as we record this sunday afternoon um we'll see where prices go we also did see brent oil 84 10 that's a half a percentage point natural gas up five dollars and 25 or excuse me up five uh five percent five point two five percent up to two dollars and sixty two cents man it'd be nice if it was up five dollars um that's uh up 13 cents relative to the open pretty unbelievable you know looking at at, at what happened to oil prices uh mainly what we're seeing is is um you know we, we saw some some economic indicators that came out from both the united states and china that that that, that at least you know possibly forecasted higher demand we did see um chinese factory output topped april forecast as they released that we did see consumer prices um increase less than expected and we also did and this is great we did see rig counts drop and we can go ahead uh, go ahead and put this chart up we did see oil rig counts jump by a drastic one to 497 um oh, which is the first increase in four weeks um, again, wow. maybe not as much as we would expect it, but we, at least we're seeing a, a turnaround in rig counts again, super, super interesting. Um, this is a quote from Tim Schneider. He's an economist over at Matador economics, local here, um, to the DFW area. Consumer prices were not as bad as expected. It gave the U S a little bit of boost, but I want to quickly talk mainly about natural gas prices, guys, a 5% increase mainly off the back of two things. We're back on Freeport now. They've continued. They've never been able to reopen. But as we move into summer and we move from a storage and we move from a store, excuse me, a, a draw to a storage build, that's going, you know, what's going to um, balance price. Remember, we draw natural gas in the winter and we store it during the summer. But if we're not, if the build in the, in natural gas reserve or natural gas strategic reserves isn't growing as quickly as the rate of electrical um, demand, which is what we saw here on on Thursday, Friday when the numbers came out. That's what's going to lead to a higher um, natural gas. That, that's going to lead to an increasing natural gas price. We did see that the EIA reported um, natural gas inventories rose less than expected. And this is, again, is, is easing concerns of a oversupplied summer, which would lead to lower prices. And again, if you're building up reserves, you've got an excess supply. So if Freeport, um, so what's interesting is that while Freeport is still sort of down and that would lead, you would think to less exports 
aka less demand or more inventories, even with Freeport being down and only having about one or two terminals up. You know, the 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 reason was um, you know, the some extreme cold that happened. I know we're talking about extreme uh, heat. <laughs> it's we're all over the place here. But earlier in March, we did have some some fairly um Cold spurt that did uh, bring about two of them down. We also did. We also did hear that there's going to be some maintenance. So with more natural gas staying uh, here at home, that should that the theory was okay. Well, we're going to see lower prices because uh, inventories are going to rise. We didn't necessarily expect that EIA came out and said we did see actually lower inventory builds than expected. And we also got a report from the Edison Electrical Institute or EEI that total electricity output uh, for the week ending in May 11th rose 2.8 percentage points um, year over year um, to about 74 4,842 gigawatt hours and cumulative U.S. electrical output um, for the 52-week period ending May 11th rose by about a tenth of a percentage point uh, to about 4.1 million gigawatt hours. So electrical demand continues to rise and consumption as well. We see inventories rising less uh, or, or, or increasing less than they what they normally should, which is why we saw a nice big swing. You know, I know a lot of people in the Permian are saying, well, when is these? When is this going to affect our Waha differential? You know, we're up to about 50 cents now you know i saw an article we're up 100 percent on natural gas prices in permit well we're you're up from negative 30 cents to 40 cents so at least you can offload some of your gas um very interesting stuff going on here um the only other thing that we saw happen and and you know we we actually saw this in this drop while i was at super doug so i didn't get a chance to cover this on thursday crescent energy to buy silver bow as the u.s shale mergers continue Crescent Energy will come in and buy Silverbow resources at a deal valued at $2.1 billion to create the largest or the second largest Eagle Ford pure player um, in the United States as the oil and gas mergers continue. Um, a quick transaction overview. Silverbow shareholders are going to get 3.12 shares of Crescent Class A common stock um, for each share of Silverbow. Um uh, common stock with the option to receive all or the portions of proceeds at a cash value of $38, uh, $38 per share, subject to a possible proration with the maximum total cash consideration for the transaction of $400 million, which means, you know, of course, Silver Bowl is going to want a little bit of cash, but they're keeping a lot of this in uh, in stock. Here's the quote from Crescent CEO David Rock Charlie. The combination with Silver Bowl, which is expected to be immediately accretive, to all key share metrics, solidifies Crescent as the leading uh, operator in the Eagleford and strengthens the company growth platform with increased share. We will see what happens from there. You know, we, we've talked at nauseum about how Kimridge was attempting to do something with Silverbow, and then all of a sudden Crescent, you know, energy from the top, you know, from, you know, from the top shelf dives in and swoops up. Going to be very interesting to see Kimridge, who is the largest shareholder with a little, with a, somewhere around twelve percent of all shares, how they how they you know push back against this. You know, you know, I think the 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 the, the key to, and I think the overarching fact here is that you know it's um it's going to be very interesting to see what Kimridge does in response to this obviously you know they were looking to basically take their Kimridge Texas gas which used to be Laredo Petroleum and see if they could slam that into Silver Bow hopefully possibly cover up what could have been an over overvaluation that they had on Kimbridge, Texas gas that is now wiped off the table. So it's going to be very interesting to see where they go from there. I guarantee we'll be doing a deal spotlight on this, but this, you know, this continues an absolutely um, crazy, crazy merger and acquisition season that we've had, you know, 2024 has, has, has been pretty crazy for the mergers um, and acquisitions. Um, you know, we've seen, we saw 51, we've seen 51 billion in deals so far. Um, according to our friends over at Inveris. So it's going to be, and we're going to continue to see, you know, we, we, we've we seen the Permian kind of wrap itself up. This is our first step out into the Eagleford. So it's going to be very interesting um, what kind of the next regions are. Obviously, you know, we've got, you know, there's there's some stuff in the Midcon and Scoop stack that could begin to uh, merge up. So, so we'll be covering all that in a bag of chips, guys. But, um, you know, Kimbridge is left uh, without a dance partner at this point. Wow. Yeah, pretty interesting. So, all right, Stu, what should people be worried about this week? That's all I've got. Well, uh, get a plan. Uh, we'll put out some suggestions, and we want people to stay alert 
and have a plan for any man-made natural disaster or a man-made disaster. We just want everybody to be prepared and be leaders in your communities. Yep, absolutely. No, we appreciate that. And we appreciate everybody checking us out here on the world's greatest podcast, energynewsbeat.com. Check us out again at said website. But with that, guys, we'll let you get out of here. Appreciate everybody. We'll, We'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you.